بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This is our second lesson covering the tafsir of Surah Abasa uh, Last week we looked at the introduction to the Surah the first few verses and the first ten verses and in particular, we looked at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the itab or the rebuke that was made, or if you could understand it as a rebuke, and we actually said it's a form of praise as well. Um, and uh, we spoke about many other issues related to that. The, the, the next part of the surah, verse 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kalla innaha tadhkira. Kalla innaha tathkira. Now, kalla, we've looked at this word already in Surah uh, uh, an naba Kalla sayya'alamun. But I think we need to maybe speak about it in a bit more detail here because um, there are different ways you can interpret this kalla. Now, generally, the scholars understand that the word kalla is used for the major reason is for الرضع and zaja, which means to rebuke and to repulse a repulsion or a rebuke uh, ibtal yani to negate something which has been previously uh, mentioned so for example in surah al-naba kalla sayalamun no indeed they will come to know. So what is this kalla used for in order to really reject the idea that there will be no resurrection? So what is this great thing that they are, or what is this thing that they are asking one another about? I.e. they're doubting the hereafter. They don't believe in the hereafter. They're rejecting it. So Allah says kalla, no. That is wrong. Their belief regarding that, it's wrong. So this is ibtal. This is rejecting and falsifying the, the previous aforementioned belief. And this is done in order to, it's a very strong word. Kalla is a very strong word, word to rebuke as well. Um, that, you know, the previous aforementioned uh, statement or, 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 or belief. So, you know, this is one major um, uh, meaning of kalla and we mentioned in the ulum al-quran classes that we had that whenever you see kalla in a surah you can more or less assume that this surah is what makki uh, why did we say that because the makki surahs many of many of the surahs dealt with the arguments of the uh, mushrikeen uh, in particular their rejection of faith and their rejection of clear and very important principles whether related to tawheed or al-akhirah uh, etc. Um, however, we find that there are some places in the Quran where kalla doesn't really convey that meaning. It doesn't really convey the meaning of a rebuke or of a you know type of repulsion, zaja or rada. So, for example, in Surah Al-Mutaffifin, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Yawma yaqoom al-nas li Rabbil Alamin." On that day where people will stand up to the Lord of the worlds. Kalla inna kitab al fujari la fi sijin. Kalla. And here I'll translate it as indeed. Just say indeed. Indeed, the, 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 the book of the evildoers will be in the sijin, a special record for the evildoers. So here, kalla has no meaning, it, it, it's not rejecting any previous concept. Look at the verse before it. يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Is there that day where everyone will stand in front of their Lord? Is that something to reject? Is that something to rebuke? No, it's not. So, كَلَّا in this case is used for emphasis, ta'kid. 
So some scholars say kalla sometimes can be used for the meaning haqqan, truly, truly. And so therefore we can say these are the two major meanings. Some scholars were of the view that no, kalla can only have one meaning. This was the view of some linguists like uh, Imam Sibawayhi, a famous Cameroon. But others were of the view like Imam Suyuti in Itqan mentioned that uh, it can really convey um, you know, those two meanings. So in this ayah, Kalla innaha tathkira. I'm not going to translate kalla as not at all or certainly not or indeed. But kalla innaha tathkira. Indeed, it is a reminder. Indeed, it is a reminder. Or it is a reminder. Innaha tathkira. Here, if we go for the first meaning, which is that kalla is used to rebuke a previous aforementioned statement, to reject it, what is there to reject from before? <coughs> is there something that we need to correct before? That has been mentioned, everything that we looked at last week, abasa wa tawalla an ja'ahu al-a'ma wa ma yudriq la'allahu yazzakka aw yazzakkaru fatanfa'u dhikra amma man istaghna fa'anta lahu tasadda wa ma alayka alla yazzakka Okay, so anything to correct? What do you think? It's the behavior. Uh, it's the behavior. The act itself. He frowned and he turned away. And we said, majority of scholars considered it an itab. This is a rebuke from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although a gentle rebuke to the Prophet. ﷺ. And even if, remember when we say it's a rebuke to Rasulullah. You know, sometimes you can be rebuked for doing something wrong, but sometimes you can be rebuked for leaving out the more appropriate thing to do. Okay? So, for example, imagine you're, you're waiting for salah, okay, between the adhan and the qam. What's the best thing to do? Make, recite Quran or make dua? Ah. Make dua, isn't it? Because we know that this is the time your dua is likely to be answered. So imagine you were sitting there reciting Quran and I corrected you. I said, look, you, you should be making dua. Make dua, it's better. This is an opportunity you won't get elsewhere really during the day like this. So go and make So I've rebuked that person. Have I rebuked him for a sin though? No, not really. It's for tarkul awla, yani leaving for that which is, you know, perhaps would have been better. So, I mean, that's just to maybe share a different perspective on the itab, on this rebuke of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa but many scholars said, yes, this kalla, it's used as a zajar, it's used as a sort of rebuke and a deterrent. For what? As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, la taf'al dhalik, don't do that. Kalla. Don't frown and don't turn away from people like that. Now this is quite strong though, subhanAllah. You know, kalla, as I said, is a very strong word. So although the, the rebuke for Rasulullah was very soft in the beginning, it's almost gradually building up. And this is a beautiful way of rebuking someone. You don't start very harsh and then become soft. Okay, rather you start off soft and then you become a bit harsh. And those who have children, okay, the worst thing you can do when you're disciplining a child is be really harsh to them and say, no, you did that wrong, and then all of a sudden you become soft and gentle with them. Why? What will happen? They'll take advantage of it. Because children, yeah, I need, they think of the last thing that happens. They don't think that far behind. They're still you know, thinking and developing their, their, their thought processes. The best thing to do though is maybe get hold of them, speak to them, calm them down, what they're doing is wrong, and then become really serious with them. And then become really serious with them. So. You know, for many people, this is a, this is a very an affect, affectionate way of, 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 of correcting someone. Okay? So, kalla, la taf'al dhalik, don't do that. And this is why some scholars like Imam, uh, al, uh, Imam al-Qurtubi mentioned that it's permissible to, after this kalla to stop. Although this is not really a, a, a place to stop in your qira'ah for Hafs and Asim. Because in other places, you know, we have after kalla, you pause. Okay, in other surahs in the Quran, if you look kalla and there's a waqf, a sign of a waqf, a sign where you pause. Because this kalla is used for referring to the previous statement or the previous 
part of the surah. Kalla. So pause. As I said in Hafs and Asim, the, the common way that we, most of us recite here, it's not, it's not usually a a, 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 a a pause. You say, Kalla innaha tathkira. We don't say, Kalla innaha tathkira. But Imam Qurtubi mentions it's ja'iz. It's permissible for, 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 for one to stop it, maybe in some other qiraat, that you can stop there. However, if we interpret Kalla to mean haqqan, truly, indeed, then this is for what is to come. Indeed, it is but a reminder. Indeed, it is a reminder. Innaha tathkira. So hence, there's a wasal, there's a continuation, and there's no pause. Let me stress this point. I feel like, I feel as though I need to make this clear that kalla can be used to refer to what came, what was mentioned before. So, in order to correct the Prophet sallam, or it's used for what is to come. Innaha. Indeed, it is a reminder. Is, is that point clear? Yeah? Okay. So, innaha tathkira. So, we can say it's a rebuke for the previous statement or it's an emphasis. Innaha tathkira. Indeed, it is a reminder. Indeed, it is a, indeed it is a reminder. Now, firstly, uh, there's an interesting discussion here which is innaha is referring to a feminine noun. Innaha tathkira. What is this ha referring to? We need to discuss that. But before that, let's just look at the, the concept here. Indeed, it is a reminder. Now, here, what's going, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to speak about the nature of this reminder. Kalla innaha tathkira. Faman sha'a dhakara. Fi suhufin mukarram. Marfu'atin mutahhar. Bi'aydi safara. Kiramin barara. A beautiful description Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. So just quickly mention the description of this nature of this reminder. Indeed, it is a reminder for those who wish to be, uh, whoever wishes that they will, um, they may, that they may remember uh, in sacred and honored uh, scrolls which are exalted and pure and in the hands of noble scribes. Um, so this is a description. Now, what is the connection between the description of this reminder and the, what we learned last week? Now, one of the points of the rebuke that we looked at last week was that the Prophet ﷺ shouldn't waste his time with people who are going to reject the truth if it means that you're going to ignore that there are people there who can really benefit from your reminder. So the idea here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning here is that this tadhkirah, this reminder from Allah, it's so honored, it's so great, it is so exalted that you shouldn't even waste your time with the likes of these people. Don't even waste your time with the likes of these people. Because this is something which is extremely honored, extremely exalted. But فَمَنْ شَاءَ ذَكَرَ for those who really wish to be reminded by it, they are the ones who will truly remember. So this is continuing on from the, uh, the previous discussion. Now, Kella innaha innaha, indeed it. Now, it innaha, this ha, this pronoun is feminine. So what is it referring to? Many say it refers to the ayat of the Qur'an, and ayat of the Qur'an is a feminine noun. Ayat is a feminine noun. Some say it refers to the surah, which is also feminine. And some say it refers to the maw'idah, or the ibrah, the exhortation or the admonition, the admonishment of Allah. Admonishment and idah or maw'idah is a feminine noun as well. So indeed, this is a admonition for you. It's an admonishment for you, Ya Rasulullah, or Messenger of Allah. So these are the, we can say, so we can say either refers to, just to summarize, the Quran or the Surah, we can put that in one category, or it refers to the, the reminder of the beginning of the Surah, this, admin, this uh, admonition of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa now, if we interpret according to the first view, 
then this is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this is a reminder, this Quran, this, this surah, this Quran as a whole is a reminder for everyone because this is a, a tazkirah for who? Is it just for the noble of Quraysh, the noble men of Quraysh, or is it for all of mankind? It's for all of mankind. Kalla, inna tazkira. It's not just for them, it's for all of the mankind. And we know a tazkira, a reminder, it's not just for the disbelievers, it's for the believers as a whole. So this is continuing on from the rebuke. Or, if we go for the other interpretation, that indeed this is a reminder, i.e. this admonishment, uh, the, the, the fact that Allah SWT is rebuking Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that this rebuke to you is just a reminder to you this rebuke inna hadhi al-maw'idha tadhkiratun laka this maw'idha this admonishment is a reminder for you so subhanallah this is a way of consoling the feelings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you know sometimes when you want to correct someone and you're afraid of being too harsh to them, what do you say? I'm just reminding you, isn't it? I'm not preaching you, I'm just reminding you. I'm not making it binding upon you, it's just a reminder. Sometimes you, you, you want to be, uh, I, I remember once uh, uh, we were doing some recordings for, for Tayyibun. Uh, um, for our conference we had last year, we had many scholars, they, they gave uh, talks for us. Um, many of them actually weren't even aired, but uh, we, we done it over the phone. So one Sheikh, I think it was Sheikh uh, Khalid Al Muslih, uh, I said to Sheikh, uh, Sheikh, are you ready to give your uh, your lecture? And I use the word muhadara. And he said, No, 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 no. It's not muhadara. It, it's just a kalima. And kalima in Arabic means what? It's just a word, just a reminder, essentially. Why muhadar is quite a big word, a lecture, you know. So just to make it make himself humble and you know, look, I'm just going to give some kalimat, some words. Okay, so just to and he humble himself. And so here, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, if, if we interpret the hard to refer to, to refer to the mawaida, this is a, a way of consoling the feelings of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So after correcting him, Abbasa wa Tawalla and Jahul Aama wa Ma Yudrika, Subhan the Prophet sallam is feeling upset now. Don't worry about it, it's only a reminder. Don't worry about it, it is only a reminder. So this is one way of looking at it. And there's no harm if you look at it from both perspectives. So as if Allah is addressing the disbelievers and addressing Rasulullah at the same time. So kalla innaha tazkira. And uh, this is what Ibn Ashur referred to as ta'nis. Ta'nis, yani putting the Prophet at ease. Making him feel easy. Uh, just uh, an interesting point here about the word tazkira. Now, tazkira is related to the word dhikr, which means to remember. And tazkira, from, from a linguistic perspective, is a very strong form of remembrance. And we have tazkir for remembrance, but tazkira. It's probably the most intense form you could use for a, for a reminder. Now, just for us to appreciate what we mean by a reminder, imagine I came to you, it's the first time I've seen you, I've never met you before, and I say to you, I'm going to remind you we have a meeting tomorrow. Now, what's the first thing you're going to say? That's, obviously, that sounds a bit strange, isn't it? I'm reminding you about the meeting both of us have tomorrow. I've never met you before. I've had no contact with you before. Because a reminder is based on what? If you've already received that information before, isn't it? Okay. A reminder is based once you've already known. You already know what the matter is, but maybe you've forgotten. You become neglectful. Okay. Otherwise. If I tell you something new, that's information, that's khabar. I've given you some khabar, I've given you some information. Tadkira is based on a reminder. Now this is really interesting because if we say indeed it is a reminder, the believers know it is the truth already. For, so for them it's understandable it's a reminder, but for the kuffar, 
they don't even accept the premise of the truth in the first place. So how is it reminded to them? Because no matter how much we be disbelieved, no matter how much people disbelieve, it will always be a rem reminder to them. Because every single human being, he gave witness that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah. Alastu bi rabbikum, qalu bala. Allah subhanahu wa taala mentions with the araf. I think around 100, verse 175. This is what we refer to as the verse of the the cover. Ayat al mithaq. Ayat al mithaq. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, and remember when we took you out from the loins of of Adam, every single human being, and He made them stand up, and He said to them, Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? Qalu bala. Indeed, you are our Lord. Allah says, and we did this in order that you could not say that we were heedless or we had no knowledge of this. So it's a part of our what? Fitrah. We know it deep down inside. Deep down inside, it is we have been built in a way to recognize and acknowledge that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah. So when they are reminded about this, it's not new to them. It's actually a reminder. They already know it. But some people will choose to reject it. So, kalla innaha tadhkira. Kalla innaha tadhkira. Now, it is reported that after this, these verses were revealed, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa never frowned in the face of any poor person after that, nor did he pay too much attention to, to the disbelievers if it meant ignoring those believers. So we can see here that Rasulullah was extremely influenced and affected by these verses. And people are influenced and affected in various different ways. Sometimes you find people, they are affected temporarily by a reminder. And this is, remember we looked at last week, we looked at the two levels of, of uh, we said there's, there's tezkiyah, and there's being reminded. Okay. So perhaps he wanted to, we said about Ibn Ummi Maktoum, perhaps he wanted to be purified or take some reminders. And we said there are two different levels. Some scholars said these are two different levels. The, the level of tezkiyah is greater than the level of, re, of a reminder. Tezkiyah is when you're, you're spiritually transformed. Whereas a reminder, it just influences you temporarily. Sometimes you go to a fiery khutbah, you know, you're all fired up, you know, then you leave the khutbah and khalas, it's all gone. That's just a, maybe a reminder, a very soft reminder for you, but it hasn't really imprinted on you. When it's imprinted on you, that's what we call tezkiyah. It's purified you, it's made you grow spiritually. Here we can see Rasulullah has been purified. He has been affected by these verses. And that's ideally how we should be influenced by and affected by knowledge. Um, okay. Kalla innaha tadhkira. The next verse, verse 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ شَاءَ ذَكَرًا So whoever wills or wishes may remember. Meaning that whoever wills to uh, take benefit of this uh, reminder, then he will be the person who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or remembers the revelation. Essentially, what does it mean? Meaning, whoever truly wants to believe and he's truthful and he wants to believe then he will be influenced and he will take and uh, and he will be admonished by these verses now this fits in beautifully with what we've been looking at in particular last week when we looked at the two individuals we looked at the, the, the leader from the Quraysh who didn't want to hear and then you have Ibn Ummi Maktoum who really wanted to benefit so this is as if it's a, a, a description 
of Ibn Ummi Maktum, فَمَنْ شَاءَ ذَكَرَ This is a reminder, but this reminder will benefit who? It will benefit those who want to remember. إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُنْذِرُ مَنْ يَخْشَاهَا Indeed you, as in the previous surah, you are a warner to who? To those who truly fear. To those who truly fear the, the hereafter. So this is reinforcing the idea that you should focus your attention on those who will benefit from this reminder. If you see someone is not benefiting from the reminder, you've given him the reminder, fine. You've given it to him, move on to those who will truly benefit from you. So this is very important when it comes to prioritizing, when it comes to giving da'wah. We need to prioritize. Um, and this pri pri uh, making this priority, it depends upon your situation. Okay, like I've come across many people who debate this issue, should we prioritize our da'wah with Muslims or non-Muslims? This is a common question. It depends on your circumstances. It depends on your circumstances. You could be gifted with the ability, uh, you could be very knowledgeable of comparative religion, so for you is to, you should prioritize with non-Muslims. Whereas if you're somebody else who is maybe more, knowled, more learned in fiqhi masail, then obviously fiqhi masail is not really going to benefit a a non-Muslim, so that person he should maybe focus on um, uh, you know, teaching Muslims how to pray and fast, etc. So, فَمَنْ شَاءَ ذَكَرَ Now here, um, some scholars were of the view that the verb شَاءَ will, whoever wills, actually refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's as if it's saying, مَنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ تَبَارَكُ وَتَعَالَ أَلْهَمَهُ That this is a reminder for those, if Allah wills, inspires him to this remembrance. I.e. Allah gives him ilham or tawfiq to understand and benefit from this reminder. So as if he's saying, look, this reminder will benefit those who Allah has guided them to it. And this, in this case is who? Ibn Ummi Maktoum or the, the leader from the Quraysh, obviously Ibn Ummi Maktoum. This is a, a man who is muwaffaq, Allah has given tawfiq. He wants to learn the guidance, as opposed to the leader from the Quraysh who is rejecting it. This is one view, as some scholars uh, mentioned, um, but it's not the, 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 the dominant view of the uh, Mufassirin. But it, I suppose it reinforces the idea of uh, tawfiq of divine support and assistance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that guidance cannot truly enter into your heart unless Allah has willed it. Now if you look at the linguistics of this verse فَمَنْ شَاءَ ذَكَرَهُ So going back to the previous verse إِنَّهَا إِنَّهَا is what feminine or masculine? Feminine. feminine. So إِنَّهَا تَذْكِرَهُ فَمَنْ شَاءَ ذَكَرَهُ Whoever wills will be, remember it. And who is it feminine or masculine? masculine? Masculine. Which is really interesting. Because it's really continuing. It's speaking about what? The tadhkira essentially, isn't it? That whoever wills, he will remember the... Whoever wishes, he will remember the, this reminder. So why is it masculine? Why is it changed from feminine to masculine? And here there's, subhanAllah, you know, so many different theories. Some actually say that the who actually refers to Allah. Whoever wills, he will remember Allah. Whoever wills, he will remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or whoever wills, he will remember Al-Quran. And the Quran is masculine. So this is to clarify that this tadhkira actually refers to the Quran. This tadhkira, it refers to the Quran and what is contained within the Quran, which includes the the uh, admonishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is within Abasa wa Tawalla as well as the Quran as a whole. Now this is amazing because if we had said it would refer to uh, if we said فَمَنْ شَاءَ ذَكَرَهَا whoever wills uh, he will remember it in the feminine that will refer just to the tadhkira and the tadhkira would be the rebuke from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we made the tadhkir uh, innaha, indeed it, instead of saying ha, we said who, then that just refers to the Qur'an and not really to the, the admonishment. 
But when you make it feminine first and then masculine, it's referring first to the admonishment and then to the Qur'an. So that way you get the best of both opinions and you're not left with either of the two. Anyhow, um, another reason why it was mentioned masculine, they say in order to, the murat al-fawasil, in order to, to, to come in line and, and, and to suit the, the rhythm of the forthcoming verses, the next verses. So if you notice, فَمَنْ شَاءَ ذَكَرَهُ فِي صُحُفٍ مُكَرَّمَةٍ مَرْفُوعَةٍ مُطَهَّرَةٍ بِأَيْدِي سَفَرَةٍ كِرَامٍ بَرَرَةٍ if you notice the sajah, the way the verses all end with that same rhythm. Okay, and this is and so is mentioned here, dhakara uh, to suit that to suit that rhythm. The next verse, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Fi suhufin mukarrama in written and this reminder, this tadkira or this Quran, it's written down on uh, uh, honored pages or honored." scrolls fi suhufin mukarrama so this is a bayan or a clarification of the virtue of this reminder that this reminder what is the nature of this reminder it is in the sacred scrolls mukarrama honored by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and subhanallah when the disbeliever hears this this is going to make him feel really small because this is a reminder. Who is this reminder for? Allah now is saying, these people don't even deserve your reminder. Go to those who truly are pure in heart. For indeed, this is a reminder which is elevated and pure in the, in the hands of honored angels, purified angels, they are pure angels. So the person who is listening to this, the disbeliever is listening to this, he feels, oh, what a shame, you know. I'm missing out on all of these khayfs. It really belittles him. Innaha, so innaha tadhi. Fi suhufin mukarrama. Now, what is this suhuf? Most scholars say it refers to Allah al mahfuz It refers to the sacred tablet in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has recorded down the Quran and all things to occur, which is above the seven heavens. The Quran is preserved in the sacred tablet, Allah al mahfuz Allah gives it another description. In verse 14, marfu'atin mutahara. It is elevated and purified. And it's elevated in two ways. It's elevated in its essence, meaning it is physically above us, in above the seven heavens, and it is aliyatul yani aliyatul makan. It is something which is very high above us, but also it is high in status as well. Okay, like Rasulullah said, man tawada'a. Man Allah. Whoever humbles himself for, to, towards Allah, Allah raises him. Okay, and this is in status as well as raising the ranks within uh, the person in the hereafter. Now, the significance of mentioning that these suhuf are marfu'a, that these scriptures and these scrolls are elevated, meaning they are untouched by any impurity. It's untouched by any impurity. You know, we, the, the, the Quran creates a lot of imagery. Anything which is generally high and elevated is pure and untouched. Everything which is low, it's debased and dirty. So these scriptures are marfu'a, elevated, untouched by any impurity. And that's why he mentions mutahara afterwards. Mutahara is mentioned straight after marfu'a. Because when it becomes really high, it's untouched. Now, what's it purified from? Now, notice he didn't say tahira, which means simply pure in essence, but mutahara means it's gone for a process of purification. It's been cleansed. So it's being cleansed from all forms of impurities. It's been cleansed from kufr and shirk. It's been cleansed from any form of ziyada or nuqsan. It's been cleansed from any additional statements or anything taken away from it. Inna nahna, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Verily we revealed the Qur'an, wa inna lahu lahafidhu, and verily we will uh, preserve the Qur'an from any additions or any subtractions or taking anything away from the Qur'an. So this, this book is uh, uh, mutahara. It is pure. 
So here we can see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken upon himself to uh, take care of the Qur'an and to protect it from any form of corruption. Allah gives further description to this, the nature of the, uh, the origins of this uh, reminder, this tadhkira, bi'aydi safara. It is in the hands of scribes. Bi'aydi safara. The word safara, linguistically, it means to, um, to become apparent. Linguistically, the origins of the word, it means to become apparent. And that's why, or to unveil even. And when the morning and when it becomes apparent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the morning and when it becomes apparent. And we say in Arabic, المرأة سفرت, the, the woman safarat, meaning she unveiled, she, show, she, she has shown her face. This is what we call sufur. Sufur is when a woman doesn't wear a veil, a face veil, a niqab. We call that in Arabic sufur. Because he, she has unveiled and shown her face. Traveling in Arabic, it's called safar. Because when you travel, your characteristics become apparent. Okay? Your true colors become apparent. It's very easy to put on certain characteristics and certain manners and, 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 and you know, behavior. When you're around brothers for a few hours. But when you travel, you know, it's very difficult to, to pretend and act. You become tired, you become frustrated, and that's when your true qualities show. Okay, so if you really want to know someone, travel with them. Okay, travel with them. Trade with them and live with them. These are the things that truly expose a person's true characteristics. If you travel with them, if you live with them, or you trade with them. So, as safara here we say it refers to the scribes, those who write down. Those who write down. Now, what has writing got to do with um, uh, what has writing got to do with unveiling or showing? Firstly, we say that these safara, these scribes, these people who write down, well, they are. It's referring to the angels, according to most scholars. Okay, these are the scribes referring to the angels, and the angels they write down many things. They write down the qadr of Allah. They write down the 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 the, the um, they are envoys who um, carry these scribes, who ca carry this revelation and pass it on to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So therefore, they are clarifying to mankind what the revelation of Allah is. They are unveiling it to mankind. They are essentially messengers. They are safir. And in Arabic language, a, an ambassador is called safir. An ambassador. It's called a safir. Why? Because the, when an ambassador comes, what does he do? He clarifies the intent of his country. Okay? You clarify the intent of your country. As an ambassador, you speak on behalf of your country. You make it clear to them what your position of your native country is with regards to, you know, whether it's related to war or peace, etc. So these are... B.A.D. Safara, these scrolls are in the hands of these scribes, these noble angels. Now some scholars were of the view, these Safara actually refer to the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because a Sifr in the Arabic language refers to like a, a, a scribe, so Asfar, plural. And these were the holders of these scribes. We know the Rasulullah, their companions, whenever revelation would come down, they would actually write it down. On, on, on parchments, on skins, on hides, on, on shoulder bones, on leaves. They would write down all of this revelation. So they were actually safara as well. They were people who wrote, wrote down these um, uh, scriptures. And so therefore, we, here we can see that this is Allah praising the... If we interpret this to refer to the companions, this is a thana from Allah. A, a form of praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, for the companions. For the companions. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the companions for being of those who convey the message and those who pass on the message. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَلْ هُوَ آيَاتُ آيَاتٌ بَيِّنَاتٌ Rather, these are clear manifest, manifest signs and ayat fi sudur in the hearts, in the chests of those people who are given knowledge. 
And who is that referring to? The companions. They were the ones who were given this knowledge. So Allah is praising them. Interestingly as well, um, this is a, we can interpret this to be a type of miracle as well. Or a foretelling of what was going to happen in the future. Because remember this is a Mecca surah. And how many Muslims are there? Just a, you can count them on your hands. Maybe a hundred or so. And when, you number, that's, when your number is that small, you don't think about having ambassadors, do you? Okay? Those of you maybe set up like Dawah organizations, you know, you have positions, isn't it? Your group might be about 10, 15 brothers. So you have like an Amir, you have someone in charge of this, someone in charge of that. Believe me, you're not going to appoint someone as ambassador. Okay? That's when it comes to state level. A Safir is when it comes to state level. So Allah, if we interpret this to refer to the companions, Allah describes them as ambassadors, subhanAllah. Ambassadors when they're in Mecca, ajeeb. So this shows you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is foretelling that these people, they are going to be ambassadors to the rest of mankind. And this is what happened, subhanAllah. If you look at the spread of Islam, the spread of Islam after the death of Rasulullah historians up until today cannot fathom how fast Islam spread. Really, it's unbelievable. You have companions all the way in Tashkent. You have companions all the way even near Europe, in Turkey. Companions as far as in you know, Egypt and, and in the West. SubhanAllah, and it's ajeeb. The, 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 the pace at which Islam spread. These were ambassadors for, you know, to, to, towards all of mankind. So it's like a bashara. It's like a glad tidings that this is going to be a religion that will spread far and wide. However, what is really apparent is that you know this ayat safara does really refer to the angels but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best and perhaps a strong evidence for this is we know the famous hadith Rasulullah said Al Mahir bil Quran ma'a safarat al kiram al barara the one who is an expert in Quran the one who is an expert in Quran he will be with a safara the these noble angels al kiram al barara and why, why in particular will the one who is an expert in Qur'an be with these angels? Because they have now taken the same role as the angels. And what was the role of the angels? To preserve the revelation and to, and to pass it down to the prophets. So they have now taken this special role. Those who are the people of Qur'an. SubhanAllah. May Allah make us from amongst them. The... Next verse gives further description to these angels. Kiramin barara. Honored and righteous. Kiram, honored and righteous. So they are honored with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these angels are kiram. They are honored. They are noble. In the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are barara. Righteous. Now, this is an interesting word, barara. Barara is a plural of the word bar. And bar is someone who is extremely righteous. But in the Quran, uh, righteous people, the, the, the plural of bar, there are two plurals of bar. One is abrar. And one is barara. Now, whenever abrar is used, it's generally referring to human beings. But barara, it's a more intense form of abrar. Abrar is just a plural of bar. And but barara, it's a more intense form. So that obviously really gives it an indication that these ayat are speaking about the angels and not human beings. Um, so, kiramin barara. Now, uh, and, and this is really to indicate the uh, uh, the um, the obedience of the of the angels to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. We have the concept of being dutiful to your parents in Arabic. We call that birrul walidain, birrul walidain, being dutiful to your parents. And we, we can understand, and I think we can all appreciate what it means to be dutiful and obedient to our parents. Okay. So the way. These angels are, are like a, is, is like the way a righteous child will be towards its parent. Obedient, taking care of and being very you know, careful of how they are in front of their parents. So these angels, 
extremely observant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This now ends this particular section of the surah. Okay, so this sec just to maybe reiterate um, uh, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described the nature of this revelation to really make it clear to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that this reminder it's so great, it's far greater than, than these lowly people of Mecca, than these kuffar, these arrogant people. It's for the honored people. It's looked after by the honored angels. It's for those people who really want to benefit. So focus your attention on those who really would benefit from it. And then, this is really interesting. Now, the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 17, قُتِلَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا أَكْفَرَهُ Cursed be man, woe to man, how, disbelieval he, how disbelieving he is, or how ungrateful he is. Now, so far, the surah has been rebuking Rasulullah and maybe showing him the correct way to, to deal with this situation. But Allah is not going to leave it at that now. See, the kuffar might be listening to this and thinking, ah, oh, look at this. Muhammad is being criticized by his Lord. Don't worry, their time is coming now. Okay, their time is coming now. And notice the difference. Look at this, subhanAllah. Fine, Allah rebukes Rasulullah but in a very gentle way. Very, very gentle way. Abasa in the third person, we spoke about this. But look how Allah addresses the disbelievers, subhanAllah. Qutila al insan. Curse be upon him. Woe to him. And qutila literally means he's been destroyed, he's been killed. So don't think that, you know, they're free from this rebuke. No, subhanAllah. Their rebuke is far stronger and far more stern. So, Qutil al Insan. But notice who the surah starts off with. It starts off with Rasulullah and then it starts off, and then it ends with the disbelievers. Okay? And then, subhanAllah, the way the surah ends is even more amazing. On that day, there will be faces that will be bright. And Allah specifically speaks about faces. Whereas the surah began with Abasa wa Tawalla. He frowned and he turned away. But then Allah says, don't worry, on that day, you won't be frowning, there'll be no reason to be sad. Subhanallah. So anyhow, this is what we'll speak about in more detail in, in due time, inshallah. Qutil al-insan. Now, very literally, literally, this verb is in the passive voice, in the past tense. It literally means man has been killed. Man has been killed. Now, this is a style in the Arabic language to, in, in, to, to make an invocation, to make a dua. It's actually a type of dua. Like when we say, Jazakallahu khayran, what does it mean? It actually means Allah has rewarded you. Allah has rewarded you. Okay, shafaq Allah, may Allah cure you. What does it literally mean? Allah has cured you. Now, this is a style within the Arabic language to indicate optimism. To indicate optimism. Jazakallah, may Allah, may Allah cure you. So, you have so much optimism, you've mentioned it in the past tense. Allah has already cured you. Yeah? Shafaq Allah. So not just optimism in the positive sense, but also in the negative. You know, قتل الإنسان قاتله الله لعنه الله May Allah's curse be upon him. Literally means Allah has cursed him. And you are so strong in your supplication that you want it to already have happened. So قتل الإنسان Extremely strong way of putting a curse on someone. قتل الإنسان And that's why whenever قتل is used in the Quran وقاتلهم الله it's always used for disbelievers. Always used for disbelievers in the Quran. It's not used for a believer. It's too strong for a believer. That's why I say Al-Insan here refers to the disbelievers by the indication of Qutila, by the fact that there's Qutila there. Even though Al-Insan looks very general, you know, may man be cursed, but because of Qutila, as we said, it really refers to the disbelievers. Now, um, 
these type of supplications or these type of du'as that you're making, you know, may his Allah's curse be upon someone. As, as one scholar commented, he said, Ad-du'a bisu min Allah ta'ala, that making a supplication of something evil to, to descend from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, it, in most cases, it is not that matter, it's not literally intended. Okay, that matter is not literally intended. Rather, what is meant is that Allah subhanahu that you're meant to belittle that person. You're trying to belittle that person, and, you know, tahqeer and warning that person, and warning others from following the way of that person. So when we say qutil al-insan, this doesn't mean therefore, let's hope that every single disbeliever dies on this earth. That's not the intended meaning. You know, Rasulullah had the option. Look at Ta'if, he had that option, isn't it? When they threw him out of the city, the angels came to him and said, Look, if you want, I can destroy this town between these two mountains. I'll do it right now. He said, No. Perhaps, you know, there would be from people from the offspring that would one day worship Allah. So, when we say, Qutil al insan, Qatalahumullah, may Allah destroy them. May Allah... The literal meaning is not intended. Maybe in some cases, maybe in a situation of war, okay. Um, and this is something actually I think really needs to be looked into nowadays because there's this concept of al-i'tida fi dua uh, transgressing in dua you know sometimes you find in certain supplications people become very strong with their supplications in a way that you never see in, this, in, the, in the duas of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam okay and uh, I mean this is something I'm personally trying to research more into uh, but some scholars have spoken about this and uh, being, you know, being very transgressive in your dua, being very strong in your dua uh, in, in, in a way which is beyond like may Allah destroy them and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make their children orphans and you know, these are duas that we hear. I'm not saying it's wrong to say this but and I think it's something that needs to be revised and maybe looked into because I don't think these types of duas ever existed in the time of Rasulullah you know, did Rasulullah ever say, make their children orphans? I mean, that's subhanAllah. Although they might be doing that to us, okay? But this doesn't mean, therefore, we do the same back to them. Okay? If they rape our women, it doesn't mean, you know, that we can go around raping their women. It's not right for the believer to do that. But anyhow, um, so, قُتِلَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا أَكْفَرَ Woe to the man, how, disbel how disbelieving or how ungrateful he is. Now, <clears throat> ma akfara, this ma or this expression ma akfara, in Arabic we call it uslub at ta'ajjub. This is what we call the verb of wonder. This is when you are astonished and amazed how amazing their disbelief is or how ungrateful they are. I notice I've used the word ungrateful and, 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 and disbelief because kafara literally means to, to cover, to cover up. That's why a farmer in the Arabic language is called a kafir. Okay, maybe not modern day terms, we wouldn't say that, but in the Quran, Allah refers to uh, 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 the, uh, the farmers as, uh, as kuffar. Um, because they, what do they do? They put a seed and they cover it up with earth and soil. Okay, so uh, this applies to kufr. Because when, the one type of kufr, not all types, one type of kufr is when you cover up the truth. Meaning you know what the truth is, but you cover it up, you choose not to accept it. That's one type of kufr. I need to stress this, is one type, not all, because there are other types of kufr. There could be another type of kufr where you're not actually covering something up. You actually sincerely believe that Islam is not the truth. That's still kufr. Okay, some people are now trying to revive this, uh, this uh, jahmi belief where... Uh, kufr is only when you know the truth and then you reject it. Otherwise, if you're not sure or you sincerely don't believe, they say this is not kufr. Kufr is a very strong word, they say. It's better to use the, the term ghayr Muslim, non Muslim. Again, kufar for people who are, you know, maybe 1% of this population of this world. No. You know, Allah has made you kafir or mu'min? Khalas. You're kafir or mu'min? The difference between the kufar and the ghayr Muslim. You know, for the wouldn't be different, would they? Uh, maybe to them, maybe I don't know. <laughs> they might. They, I think they've created this third category, you know. So, <laughs> so um, 
and to to be ungrateful as well kafara can mean to be ungrateful because you receive these blessings and you're covering up the fact that Allah has given you all of these blessings now both of these meanings can be implied here both of these meanings can be implied here why because if you look at what is to come next Allah will mention his favors upon man Allah will mention his favors upon man but he will also mention those things that point to the fact that he is their creator so it, can, it actually means both meanings perfectly well and this will become evident now some other scholars were of the view that this ma is ma of istifham this is a ma of interrogation, ma of questioning yani what made him disbelieve? after all the things that I will mention now what made man disbelieve? I've given him this tathkira I've given him this reminder how can he disbelieve still after all of this? so it's a rhetorical question okay it's a rhetorical question for tawbiq to really bel bel belittle them Now, verse 18, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then clarifies this, this ayah. It clarifies the previous ayah. How could they disbelieve? How amazing their disbelief is. And then Allah will explain how this is the case. Because Allah says, Min ayyi shayin khalaqa? From what thing did Allah create him from? What thing did Allah create man from? And this is a beautiful way, just like we learned in Surah An Naba, question and answer format. He didn't say Allah created him from a drop of sperm. No, min ayy shayn khalaqa, to get the minds thinking. Amma yatasa'alun, what are they asking one another about? Anil Naba illa azim. Okay, so question and answers. So this is really tashwiq, yani to get the people thinking. Min ayy shayn khalaqa, tayyib, what were you created from? Allah says verse 19 min nutfatin khalaqahu faqaddara he created him from a drop a drop of sperm subhanallah this filthy drop of sperm that's the that's your origins that is your origin but the argument is still progressing that's not just all the argument is progressing as we will see min nutfatin khalaqahu that Allah he created faqaddara and then then immediately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala proportioned man. He proportioned man. How did he proportion him? And he gave him two legs, he gave him two eyes, he gave him two, two arms. He made him tall, he made him short. And we know that uh, when, the, when, the angel, when, the soul, when the angel blows the soul into the, to the body, all of these things are decreed. Whether it be happy, whether it be sad, whether it be male, whether it be female, whether it be guided or not guided, whether he, what type of provisions he will have. All of these things will, would have been decreed. And this is from this drop of spam, subhanAllah. All from this drop of spam, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees these things for him. Then the argument proceeds, you were created from this. So, min ayy shayn khalaqa, min nutfatin khalaqahu faqaddara. In the next verse. And then he facilitated the path for him. He facilitated the path for him. Now, what is interesting to note is the order of this verse. As opposed to saying, And that's the, if you know a bit of Arabic, you know that would be the general. Um, Structure. You have the 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 fi'il, the fa'il, and the maf'ul bihi, the object at the end. But here, the object is being mentioned first. ثم السبيل يسره. Now, w w w this is to maybe to into into emphasize um, this sabil, this path. What is this path that Allah is referring to? Many say it refers to the path in which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala brings the child out of the mother of the womb of the mother. There's a sabil. There's a pathway in which the child comes out. But look at the thumma sabila, yes, and then Allah made it easy. Okay, those of you who are parents, especially mothers, you know, you appreciate this. You know, a child is not a small thing. When a child is born, it's relatively small. And to come out of this path, it's a ajib, it's, a, it's an amazing experience. 
And it, 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 the, the mind cannot really fathom how this happens. It's truly amazing. But Allah facilitates it. But a mother might think, Subhanallah, yani, I went for a lot of pain to give birth to this child. So how did Allah make it easy? How did Allah make it easy when in reality it was really hard? You know, some people, they go through hours of labor. But believe me, it was easy. What made your water break? What made you have contractions? What made you give birth after the child was fully developed? Was it your own intention? Was it your own will? No, subhanAllah, it was all beautifully planned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Beautifully planned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thumma sabila, so Allah made it easy, but others interpret um, the sabil here to refer to the path generally of life. And he, then he made the path, the sabil, to the truth easy for him. Allah facilitated it. Allah facilitated the, the path to guidance for him. How did he facilitate it? Firstly, Allah gave him an aql. Allah gave him intellect, by which he can think and discern between right and wrong. Allah gave him fitra. Allah gave him a natural disposition to recognize the truth. So Allah didn't expect us to believe in something which was so supernatural and so, you know, unimaginable by man. No, it's very easy to believe. It's very imaginable. It's nothing too difficult. You know, this leap of faith that people speak about, it's not like trying to believe in something which is, you know, too difficult for the human mind to comprehend. So he's given us intellect, he's given us fitra, he's given us revelation, he's given us wahi. And that's when the revelation and the fitrah combines together. This is when you get nurun ala nur, light upon light. And this is in fact what the ayah of ayat al-nur refers to. Nurun ala nur. Light upon light. This is when the light of revelation, it combines with the light of your fitrah. So he's given you that. He's given you messengers, prophets. He's given you scriptures. He's given you also ayat kawniyya. He's given you universal signs that all point to his oneness. He's given you all of these things. So he's made it easy for us. There's no reason to disbelieve. And one of the strange things, yani you'll find many atheists, they say, you know, I remember Stephen Hawking once saying that uh, uh, if, if, if I am resurrected, so this indicates that he's still agnostic really by nature, if I am ever to be resurrected, I will say to God, why didn't you give us clear enough signs? So, uh, the fact that he's even saying that, it really indicates that there are signs, because he's doubting it. He won't even pose that question if he knew it wasn't to, you know, to be the truth. But the signs are there. The signs are there, but it's upon man to reflect and use his intellect to, to believe in these signs. So, thummas, and this is, uh, so, so far, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is belittling man, making him realize that he comes from this small drop of, of, of sperm, and then Allah mentions his favor upon him. He brought him out from the womb of his mother in this way, after taking care of him, by giving him the nutrients and, and, and nourishing him in the womb of his mother. He took him out in this easy manner, and he guided him to the straight path. He gave him all of these options. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ أَمَاتَهُ فَأَقَبَرَهُ And then he caused him to die, and then he buried him in the ground. Notice here, we are using thumma and fa in quite a few instances. Uh, in verse uh, um, uh, 19, min nutufatin khalaqahu fa. So Allah created from a drop of sperm, then He immediately fashioned him and proportioned him. And this fashioning and proportioning and proportioning and deciding of male or female happens usually immediately after fertilization. These things are being, you know, decreed almost immediately. Then he guides him, if we say then he guides him to the straight path. Now this obviously happens many years after you are born, isn't it? A child usually isn't given, you know, religious guidance like that, usually when someone is mature. So hence, thumma thumma indicates a tarahi or a more distant future. Thumma amatahu, and then he caused him to die. And then obviously when he dies, he usually dies a long time afterwards, he is born. That's why thumma is used rather than fa. But then look at this, listen to this. Thumma amata fa aqabara. He didn't say thumma aqabara. Then he causes him to die. And then immediately he puts him in the ground for burial. 
Now, this is, uh, uh, it's no point mentioning the next point actually, but we'll leave the next point, but um, uh, some scholars actually, based upon this verse, Mas'ala, they said this is where we get the idea of burial from. Um, amatu then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed him in the ground, in a metaphoric way, because it's not Allah himself that does it, but it is the people that do it. But we get the idea of dafan or burial from this ayah. So all of these ayat, all of these signs, so from the fact that he was created from a drop of sperm, and this is really to break his pride, to indicate that he comes from a drop of sperm, this is to break his pride and his arrogance, and then to remind him of the favors that Allah has bestowed upon him by showing him guidance, and then showing, and then to, to, to finish that section off with the fact that he causes him to die, and that he will um, uh, you know, put him in the ground, ثُمَّ إِذَا شَاءَ أَنْ شَرَحَ And then, in verse 22, and then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, أَنْ شَرَحَ He will resurrect him. And أَنْ شَرَحَ literally means to scatter. Make, he will make them all scattered. Because when Allah resurrects us, we will come out of the graves as if we are scattered creatures, as if we are scattered insects. That is how it will be. All in one instance, not just one by one, but in one instance. And this is to show you the qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And upon that point, inshallah, we will conclude today's lesson. Really, the, the next verse, I think, uh, you know, is, is still connected to this section. But inshallah, we need to discuss that verse in some detail. So we will look at that next week, uh, inshallah ta'ala. So upon that, inshallah, we'll end. Jazakum khairan. Subhanakallah. Alhamdulillah. 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 Alhamd